Welcome back to Stable Pod, a podcast where we speak to the operators, builders, and stakeholders working on the decentralized systems of tomorrow. I'm your host, Juan Escavel. I'm joined by my co-host, Gustav Arentoft. How are you feeling today, Gustav? Very good. Pleasure as always. Today's guest is Building Chronicle, a next-generation Oracle protocol born out of MakerDAO. Nicholas Kunkel is the founder at Chronicle, a team on a mission to develop frictionless, decentralized, and verifiable infrastructure for all on-chain data transmission. Welcome to the podcast, Nick. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, pleasure. Nick, I, I want to, before we dive into all the exciting work you're doing with your team at Chronicle, I'd love to first hear about your time uh, as part of Maker's Oracle core unit. Uh, what were some of the key lessons you learned uh, as part of the core unit? Um, so I think the, the core unit era of Maker was like a very interesting time uh, because it was kind of Maker really fulfilling this like... Uh, kind of like gradual decentralization ethos uh, that I had promoted, right? So we went from a foundation kind of like hierarchically run corporation almost um, into, you know, a, a dozen uh, kind of autonomous teams uh, that, you know, were um, kind of like supported by the DAO itself, right? Rather than than some centrally run corporation, and it, it really like was like the, the first time, right, that you really had like governance fully at the wheel, right, controlling like every every element. So, um, I, I mean, some of the challenges that we experienced, I mean, uh, you can imagine uh, if you're running a team within uh, a company, right, you don't really have to worry about setting up a legal entity um, operational issues, um, you know, uh, uh, like running, running a team from like the nuts and bolts perspective, right? It's more just about uh, delivering work that's kind of in line with the, the overall strategy. So I think it was probably uh, uh, not just for myself, but I think for a lot of the other core unit uh, kind of uh, leadership uh, probably quite difficult to go from this like individual contributor type of uh, role into really like more of this um, almost founder type of role. So, so I, I would say uh, that part was quite challenging, um, but I would say also <clears throat> ultimately the most rewarding because it taught me the skill set that I needed, right? To uh, uh, that I now leverage, right? Uh, being the founder of Chronicle. So, um, <clears throat> of course, under the foundation, um, you know, there are some advantages uh, and disadvantages. And, and here you mentioned, you know, some of the disadvantages of, you know, working this core unit model. Um, and of course, now you're like, you know, completely out on your own, your own boss and in, in, in charge of the team. Um, in like the core unit model specifically, what were some of the advantages you, you felt like? Was there some things that you felt like worked? Because, I mean, we I guess all of us can agree it's not there anymore because it ultimately didn't really work mm -hmm. as it was intended to. But, but what were maybe some of the components that you felt like actually worked uh, under that model? Sure. Uh, so I think teams had a lot more autonomy and that was both a good and a bad thing, right? So um, when you're working within uh, a company, you have uh, a lot of stakeholders and just uh, you need to get consensus among stakeholders and things tend to go a lot slower. Um, when you're a core unit, uh, you have much more autonomy, right? And so things that would normally take quite some time is just your team making an internal decision and, you know, moving on with your lives, right? So um, it, it definitely accelerated progress in that respect. Um, but where I think this autonomy was kind of a double-edged sword was in terms of uh, when you're working on large-scale projects, that require multiple teams, right? Multiple core units to work together. Um, it's difficult to have, uh, to coordinate in a very effective manner, um, especially because there was this idea, right? That core units were part of like this flat hierarchy, right? And so there wasn't any kind of like manager or like executive forcing function outside of governance. And I think um, what we kind of learned was that, you know, um, decentralized governance is good for certain things. 
it's really not good at trying to manage or coordinate um, on such a granular level, right? And so, so I, I definitely think that was some of the challenges that that were experienced, um, and and I think some of those those were kind of addressed in in kind of like the end game uh, model. I mean, it's, it's arguable that the, the I mean, the, there's a lot of different core, core units at the time. It's arguable that the Oracle core unit. Um, is one of the most successful ones, right? Because you're here standing today, right? Do you have any? Do you have any takes on that perspective? Sure. Um, I mean, look, e even when the foundation wound down, right? I mean, there's many teams that applied to be core units that you know governance just didn't, you know, um, approve right away, right? Uh, you know, the uh, like MakerDAO was without a marketing core unit for. Um, pretty substantial period of time. And I think that kind of showed, I think there was a uh, probably externally that looked like quite abrupt because you had like a, um, from a marketing perspective, you had like maker in your face kind of doing announcements constantly, um, right. Prior to the foundation shutdown. And then as soon as you switch to the core unit model, I think, uh, uh, it was like radio silence, right. And it probably must've looked like, you know, what happened to maker, uh, are, are they gone? Are they still here? Right. Um, so, you know, I, I definitely think uh, certain functions, right, translated well to a core unit type model versus others uh, did not, right? And, you know, there, there's always things like uh, personnel issues, right? If someone quits in a company, right, no problem, right? You can, uh, you interview more people, you put out a JD, you, you hire another person, right? Easy. Um, if say a leader of a core unit quits, um, that is a much more difficult process, uh, to replace said person. Right. And it can lead to, um, a lot of disruption, right. And not necessarily like a smooth type of handover. So, um, I'd, I'd like to think that, you know, part of the reason the Oracle core unit was so well was that we had a lot of continuity, right. Uh, we've, never had anyone really quit. We had one person kind of like semi-retire. Um, but for the most part, the team that, you know, we, we had in the foundation is, you know, we still have those same guys today, right? And they're like some of the most senior people now and some of like the biggest domain experts in, in the Oracle space. So, so Nick, could you uh, walk us through the moment um, it was decided to spin off uh, the, the uh, Chronicle team from, from Maker to stand on, on its own? What, what was that like moment like the discussions going on in the room? Sure. Um, so I, so I think one of the things that we struggled with as a core unit and, and that were kind of alleviated in the transformation to Chronicle was um, the ability to um, have autonomy over our kind of objectives on the roadmap. Uh, so when you're like within a larger organization like maker um you know, if we, if we say that governance is going to kind of be the king, right, um, then governance can tell us at any point in time, right, you're going to work on this, right, or you're going to work on that, right? And that's extremely disruptive to um, kind of uh, our own kind of internal longer term objectives, um, especially when um, you may not have like complete consistency with governance either. So when you do a governance vote, it's kind of a snapshot of what the token holders think at that point in time. Um, the makeup of like distribution of token holders can change over time, right? So maybe you work on a project for like a year and then a year later, right? You and four other, five other core units have all been working on like this big major project, right? And it's what you've put basically 100% of your attention to. And then governance just goes like, you know what? Never mind. We're, we're not interested in, in that anymore, right? Um, and, and so I, I, I can understand on the business side, right? Business objectives change. Uh, but I can tell you on the developer side, uh, nothing pisses off a developer more than uh, for you to like throw away the, the work that they've been like, you know, slaving away on for, for a year. So I think it kind of, that was kind of like the beginning of us kind of deciding, hey, you know, if we really want to 
have a shot at this if we really want to like uh, revolutionize the Oracle space. We can't do it from within Maker itself, right? We have to we have to have that autonomy, and it, I, I don't think it was very contentious because Maker itself was kind of iterating um, on the the core unit kind of governance and, and and working style anyway, and and around the same time, right? Rune had proposed the end game, and I think the end game was uh, kind of solved a lot of the uh, problems that the core unit model had. But in particular, it carved out kind of like two different roles within the DAO, right? And one was uh, this sub DAO type of role, which um, is essentially right. You are a part of, you know, the the Maker Protocol, right? Uh, and the Maker Protocol is like giving you your funding, right? And uh, you have this other type of um, like tangential role that is uh, an ecosystem actor. Right. And ecosystem actors are you can kind of think of them as like service providers to the DAO. Right. And, uh, you know, the DAO may pay them for that service. Right. Um, but you're not, you know, getting your entire business like funded by that. Right. And so ecosystem actors would need to kind of like seek um, to either have multiple customers. Right. To, to make their business viable. Right. Or to kind of seek like external investor funding. Um, and so ultimately, you know, uh, the transition right from the Oracle core unit to Chronicle, I think was like um, a, a very like natural uh, progression, right? That, that had kind of just like um, resolved itself over time rather than like this binary zero to one uh, type of moment. I think like, um, I mean, it's, it's pro probably also because like, uh, I think like a lot of people, they would, you know, even think like, why did Maker have its own Oracle team, right? Mm -hmm. So I think maybe you can also just tell us a little bit like about the history and of why that came to be, right? Because I think most of people who's in Web3 today, they see Oracle as a standalone product, okay. uh, which you, you know, only today is becoming, right? Um, so maybe you can, you can tell us a little bit about like what, what the story is of, of Chronicle. Well, I mean, that's really like the story of Maker, right? And I, I think for those, you know, who haven't been in the space for, gosh, what has it been now? Like eight years? Yeah. Um, like, let's let's take a time machine, rewind eight years. Like eight years ago in crypto, um, there was nothing. And I don't just mean like, like there was actually nothing. Like I remember like when I joined Maker, Maker was one of like five projects like total that existed on Ethereum. Um, and so when we were trying to like build DAI, I think, you know, we would run into like the most basic of roadblocks, like, oh, DEXs don't exist. Well, great, let's go invent DEXs, right? And I think a lot of people don't realize that Maker really like broke the ground, like was like the trailblazer in basically every area um, for oracles. There were no oracles on Ethereum. Uh, Maker had to build their own oracles. We made the first oracles on Ethereum. It was myself and Mariano Conti. Um, even in other areas like uh, Solidity code, like developers nowadays, like when you run into like an error in your code, you can see exactly where it failed, why it failed. We didn't used to have that. Um, the only way to know that your code failed was you tried to you know trigger a transaction on etherscan and it would say out of gas and you would know that it failed somewhere but you had no idea where in the execution it failed um, so you know maker had to develop like the first like debugger uh, for for solidity code right and so um, really like everything maker built back then was a you know um, was out of necessity right and it's kind of been really interesting to see those initial um, we never thought of them as products. We just thought of them as like, this is the this is the latest hurdle for working on the thing we actually want to work on, which is a stable coin, right? So, I mean, the the DEX, right, went through multiple iterations, right? It went through, uh, it became uh, Maker Market, then it became Oasis, right? Um, and eventually, right, Oasis was, uh, was, was deprecated, um, right? The Oracles, I mean, we went live in May of, 2017, right? And and those were, you know, the oracles that, you know, Simple Die launched with and that single collateral die used. Um, we did an upgrade for multi-collateral die, right? 
and uh, we we just didn't upgrade for for the end game uh, as well, right? Um, but it, it's kind of funny because that original Oracle protocol is not just you know uh, one of is not just the first Oracle protocol on Ethereum, but it's actually one of the oldest protocols period um, on Ethereum because there's not much from back then that's still like continuously running uh, today. So you know we've definitely you know knock on wood right. Um, built up, you know, that, that lindiness, right. Of, uh, of not really having a hack, right. And having secured, I, I think at its peak, it was something like $22 billion of TVL for, for maker. Totally. I think, um, I think you guys are of course leading with that, with this whole new brand, trying to make sure people, you get that messaging across to, to the ecosystem that you guys have been doing this for, for years, um, you know, securing, I, I mean, I, I get it, right? The the Chronicle brand itself is new and, and people don't recognize it and they probably haven't seen it before. Um, but the protocol and and the team, right? It's uh, it's essentially, right, uh, has been here for for almost seven years now. Cool. Yeah, I think I think that this is like a, I think like a really good context, right? To also, I think like, <clears throat> why a lot of people are really excited for, for where you guys are taking this now, right? Because you kind of like were, were born uh into DeFi from the very early days and i think we see a lot of competition in the in the oracle market right so i think we are like a lot of people who is very excited to see you know where you know kind of chronicle is going to find its place now when you're allowed to mm-hmm. to roam free and and you know finally uh let, let your fing- wings fly um but uh but yeah you're definitely not a new kid on the block yeah i, I mean uh, maybe that's where we go next right um you know why did we build chronicle why why did we why do we need another, you know, Oracle protocol, right? Um, and you know, the the, the motivations there uh, were really right. If we flash back to like 2022, um, it's after DeFi summer. It's you know we're in a bull run, um, and gas prices are crazy, right? Um, we're seeing you know uh, 500 Gwei default, a um, thousand Gwei, just another Monday, right? Uh, I think at one point uh, we even saw 3,000, 5,000, even 7,000 Gwei. Excuse me. Um, and and so, you know, when when you look at like, well, what does that mean, right? Uh, at, at some point you kind of become numb to like these these gas price, you know, numbers, right? Uh, well, I can tell you in dollar terms, it was we were spending thousands of dollars for each Oracle update. Um, you know, uh, there was a day where probably we spent like, I think, Two hundred thousand dollars in a single day, just on gas for for updating oracles, and uh, this, you know, if it was any protocol except for Maker, this would have been like completely unviable, right? Uh, but because Maker was making you know hundreds of millions of dollars in revenue, um, Maker ended up spending six and a half million dollars on gas just for oracles in twenty twenty two. Right, which is which is a crazy number, right? And like only maker would look at that and be like, "Well, that's a lot of money," but you know we don't want to like switch to something like Chainlink because they're experiencing those same costs, and eventually they'll have to externalize those costs, right? So Chainlink oracles were like free for the longest time, and you know. Um, but it was free because it was funded by them being able to, you know, uh, dump tokens, right? Or, or, you know, dump is probably the wrong word, right? Uh, investors were buying lots of tokens at high valuations and Chainlink had those hundreds of millions of dollars to burn, right? Uh, to, to throwing at, at oracles that otherwise weren't really sustainable. And so that was the problem that we were trying to solve. And, you know, credit to, to Maker, right, for recognizing that eventually push has to come to shove, right? And so someone really needs to create a sustainable Oracle. And if the private market isn't going to figure it out, then, you know, Maker is just going to like tip the scales a little bit. So, you know, we're incredibly grateful, right? That uh, that Runa and, and the rest of, you know, the Maker kind of governance um, kind of recognized the need for that, right? And and funded us for for all of those years, right? Uh, letting us do that research, right, and really giving us the breathing room to develop this protocol in the right way, 
and not having to release it to market until we were absolutely ready because there wasn't this like ticking time bomb of just watching, you know, gas bleed away on, on these like stone age oracles that were incredibly inefficient. So, uh, Nick, today, like what, what makes you then different than another private market oracle? Because, you know, I think like now you are becoming a, a private market oracle, mm -hmm. right? So maybe yeah. tell us a little bit about what sets Chronicle apart. Well, I, I think it's like the mechanism, like the architecture that we've designed is something completely different from uh, what anyone else has. So um, Chronicle is utilizing Schnorr signatures. Uh, which is a signature aggregation scheme that's been used in Bitcoin for uh, a number of years now. Um, and essentially what this allows you to do is it allows you to, instead of having um, uh, validators kind of reach consensus by all generating one signature each, uh, you can instead have this many to one relationship of like many validators just generating one signature. Um, and so this allows you to um, get an enormous amount of optimization and efficiency um, kind of like across the board. So not just on Ethereum, but also on layer twos. And it's kind of funny because it's almost like paradoxical because uh, layer twos and Ethereum have very different constraints, right? On layer twos, they're optimized for super cheap compute, um, but data is relatively expensive, right? And on Ethereum, uh, compute is relatively expensive, um, but data is relatively cheap, right? So um, to, we really wanted to come up with like one generalized solution that could really optimize for like both of these environments. And so Schnorr signatures really allowed us to do that. Um, and so the other piece was that we kind of wanted to achieve this scalability benefit but we didn't want to have to make trade-offs on the security and decentralization side. And so like, what do I mean by that? Well, typically in other Oracle protocols, when they want to, um, they, they have this relationship of like one-to-one -one of the number of validators to the cost to update the Oracle, right? And this is because each validator is generating like one signature. and so. The way a lot of like Oracle protocols have looked in the past of like, well, how do we reduce costs is, well, if you just get rid of some of the validators, you have less signatures. And so now the Oracle is cheaper to update, right? And um, this works to an extent, um, but you're really crippling your Oracle from a decentralization and security point of view, because the less validators you have, now there's a smaller and smaller and smaller number of people that need to collude to compromise the Oracle. And so what was so kind of revolutionary about short signatures was, yes, you got those huge scalability benefits where you know we were now six to eight times cheaper than existing Oracle solutions, but we did so without having to trade off on the number of validators. And actually we were able to increase the number of validators. So what short signatures allows us to do is decouple this relationship between the number of validators and the cost and the cost to update the Oracle. And so now like we can do something that no one else is doing, which is just onboard validators, onboard validators, onboard validators. And I think you'll see, you know, in the coming weeks and months, um, we're going to be announcing, you know, tens of new validators. Nick, could you, uh, pers uh, could you explain a little bit, uh, the architecture, uh, for my smooth brain here? Uh, cause I, I noticed that you guys take a monolithic approach to your, uh, Oracle architecture as opposed to a modular, which I believe is more like chain link. Correct. I was reading the chaos labs recent piece and they were arguing the, the two different approaches. Um, so, uh, I, I would say like most Oracle protocols work exactly the same way and they, they kind of market themselves a little bit differently. So you have validators and those validators can communicate with each other. Well, well, let, let's take a step back. You have validators. Who is running the validators? Um, for Chronicle, like it's people like Etherscan, Infura, Gnosis, uh, Gitcoin, right? MakerDAO, um, Argent. We have other kind of reputable projects in the space that run validators, right? Um, 
there's some Oracle protocols out there that, you know, will just run their own validators, which is kind of pointless because you're just reaching consensus among yourself. Like there's kind of no point in having validators, but uh, I'm, I'm sure they'll, they'll figure something out. Um, and so now you can have these validators communicate with each other. And what do you use as like the communication medium? You can use a peer-to-peer -peer protocol, um, which is what you know uh, Chronicle does. It's what Chainlink does. Um, or you can have them communicate via a uh, via another blockchain, right? So like some kind of data availability layer, right? So instead, each validator is just publishing the data to a uh, blockchain, and so the validators can read, you know what the other validators posted on that blockchain, right? Um, and so I wouldn't necessarily s describe any of these as like, oh, this one's monolithic or this one's modular. It's just kind of like, what is the substrate that you're using for communication? So in terms of like Chronicle, uh, we use um, kind of multiple redundant layers. So we use libp 2 p we use secure scuttlebutt, and we use Tor. Um, and so the idea here is that the validators are communicating on each of these redundant layers. And so even if there's ever like an exploit or a hack in say like libp 2 p there's some kind of like a zero day that like someone's trying to take out like uh, the libp 2 p network, well, no problem. We still have secure scuttlebutt and we still have Tor and uh, data is kind of just like water. It will kind of just like go through the cracks um, with the path of least resistance. And yeah, so, so I, th so I think when people kind of refer to like modular versus monolithic, I think what they mean more is like the, where the data is going to be like published and what the relationship of like the validator communication network that's like generating the data versus like the publishing piece, right? what is like the interface between those two look like? And so for us, it's quite blockchain agnostic because the um, relays that push data on chain are also just communicating with the validators via lib P2P, SSB and, and Tor, right? Versus in something like Pith, for instance, right? Um, they're using Pithnet, right? Which is just their white label for a uh, fork of Solana, right? Or in the case of Redstone, right? They're using Arweave, right? So that's their kind of, right? Remember we talked about like this substrate for communication. It's just different teams selecting different substrates. And so for us, like these substrates are just plug and play, right? Um, there's no reason we can't use the blockchain. We've actually, you know, talked to, to teams relatively, recent, actually, relatively recently, um, actually about, you know, including, um, uh, a blockchain is like uh, another substrate, but it would be like in addition to, right? Because the more you have kind of working in parallel, the more resiliency you can kind of build up and like um, lower the statistical chance for like an outage to to ever occur. Nick, Nick, talk to me about, so you mentioned the validators, which is obviously, uh, you know, the path to decentralization, further decentralization for your Oracle protocol. Uh, could you speak a little bit about like the, the unique challenges of trying to decentralize Oracle protocols, perhaps for our listeners that maybe aren't as familiar with, you know, because decentralizing a lending protocol is probably going to be very unique to decentralizing Oracle protocol. So could you maybe speak a little bit to that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I, well, one, right, it's, you have to build up this validator network and, um, you know, uh, you want to build it with credible players, right? Um, so uh, I, I would say it's quite difficult, right, to go to someone like Infura and be like, hey, do you want to run a validator? Like their default res response will be like, no, right? So I, I would say, you know, part of um, what has enabled us to be able to do that is because the, you know, we've been in this industry for quite some time. And uh, I think a lot of these teams kind of recognize the need for a truly decentralized solution. You know, they're looking at like the Oracle landscape and they're just like, we really thought you guys would have figured it out by now, but you haven't. And so, you know, a lot of their motivations come from being really aligned with, with that ethos. Um, but once you have the validator network, right, then it's, 
well, okay. Um, is there any centralized pieces of infrastructure here, right? So uh, a good example might be data. Where do you get data from? Um, you can, for example, go directly to the source, right? And so you can go to the exchanges like Coinbase, Kraken, right? Binance. You can go to the on-chain DEXs, right? The Uniswaps, the Sushi Swaps, right? The uh, the Jupiters, right? Um, you know, across the, the curves, right? Whatever it is. Um, or you can go to like an aggregator, right? And like, well, if you go to an aggregator, like a, like a, then great. You now have a new centralized dependency on the data aggregator. And so while they may let you query data a little bit faster because you can get around like rate limiting that a lot of the exchanges will, will do, um, you know, it, it it's completely centralized at this point, right? And so these are like the trade-offs that you, when you're building an Oracle that you encounter everywhere, right? And it's typically, um, typically the decentralized solution is not usually the most performant one. That's typically what, what it kind of comes down to. And so it's like, do you want to have data at like a rapid speed and get super low latency? Well, great. You're probably like compromising on decentralization at that point. And, and that's okay, right? Some people want to optimize for that latency, but you need to be conscientious about that you are making that choice, right? Um, another example might be, right, we talked about querying data from on-chain, right? So from, from Uniswap and, and Curve and, and Sushi and the like. Um, well, what RPCs are you using to get that data? Are you just using, you know, Alchemy or Infura? I mean, that's fine. But what if Alchemy or Infura goes down? Are you just unable Which to get data? Are you just have? unable to get data from on chain? What if Alchemy or Infura get hacked and the uh, hacker is just able to like spoof, you know, your uh, RPC queries to a, an Infura node to just respond whatever they want it to say, right? So now someone can just manipulate the data that the validators are receiving, and so the validators are receive are attesting to malicious data, right? So you don't want to use, you know, um, RPC services, right? You really want validators, right, running their own RPC nodes, right? Having their own, um, you know, direct access to the ledger. Well, if you want validators to run their own RPC nodes, RP running RPC nodes is expensive, right? Um, running a full node for Ethereum, right, is hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of gigabytes, um, for the L2s, right? Um, those nodes are even bigger and they're grow, they grow at, they're growing at a much quicker, like the state size of like a L2, like RPC node is growing much quicker than the state size of like an Ethereum RPC node. And so now it's the more chains you want to support, right? If you want to keep it decentralized, um, you know, you, the costs kind of go up exponentially. Right. Um, you also have problems of that. A lot of these L2s are quite young and and still in this primordial kind of state um, where their infrastructure is not exactly the most um, robust yet. Right. And, and it's it's not that they're bad. It's just uh, they're they don't have, you know, the eight plus years of like, you know, stability and you know, track record that Geth has been able to build up, right? So these nodes are quite fragile, right? They are, they have bugs, right? And so you need, uh, you need to be up, they're getting patched constantly and you need to be updating them constantly, right? And so when I say you, each validator needs to be updating them constantly, right? So uh, in, in terms of like, how do you build a decentralized Oracle protocol? I think there's a gradient, right? And I think if you, at every decision, like choose this, like um, the most decentralized option, you're going to run into roadblocks that make this Oracle like unviable from a business perspective, because maybe you can build the world's most decentralized Oracle and it would cost, you know, a million dollars a year, right? And that's not something that's really affordable or like approachable for most protocols, right? And so there's, um, it's really just about choosing, you know, where on that spectrum 
is kind of the optimal set of trade-offs. And I think that's why you see so many Oracle protocols uh, because they're all deciding where on that gradient, like is is their best trade-off? Do they, do they see the most opportunity? And unfortunately, um, you know, I, I would say that most of them definitely err more towards the side of like performance and much less towards the side of decentralization. And that's where I think we've kind of taken a different set of trade-offs where, you know, we've retained, for example, um, scalability and security. Uh, and actually, I think that's that's where we outperform everyone. Um, and But I think where we kind of take the hit or where, where like we take the trade-off is probably on latency. Um, the way that store signatures kind of work is, um, right, it's an aggregated signature scheme. So it's many people working together to generate this one signature. Um, but during its construction, there's a lot of like intermediate signatures. And the way that you generate one of these store signatures is that every validator has to sign in a sequence. So it's not necessarily able to be done in parallel. Um, and so the more validators that you end up having, right, the longer latency period you're going to have to be able to compose this signature. And so for some protocols, right, that doesn't matter because the block time is going to be, you know, uh, or for some chains, that doesn't matter because the, the block time of the chain is greater than, you know, any latency that you have from this part of the, the process. Um, but you see other chains, right? Like, for example, um, Solana has like really, really quick blocks, right? And in that case, right, um, you know, this this does kind of come into play because then you can't really um, update the Oracle every single block. I think, um, I mean, of course, like listening to you here, I mean, Oracles are, I think, I think still one of the most complex topics we are kind of like uh, going around with within the Web3 space. And decentralization of it, I think, has always been a problem, right? And I think it's it's always something that people have seen as being like, you know, a little bit centralized, you know, components in, in most DeFi protocols. I think today a lot of DeFi protocols have other centralized components in them as well. But but at least like in the early days, this was kind of like seen it. Um Apart from the decentralization, the technical side, you know, uh, which which is what you've just gone through now, um, do you think like we will see like decentralization on the governance side for the oracles as well? Like, do you think we we should see maybe a community, you know, driving some of these trade offs? Right. I know, of course, some of them would be like into like you wouldn't be able to change them basically, right? Um, but but I think like we haven't really seen this this yet. Why do you think that is? And and you know, do you think we will end up going there? Well. I think what I kind of learned from, you know, being in, in a DAO uh, with you as well, right, Gustav, uh, for, for many years a maker, right, is that DAOs are um, good at making kind of decisions when they have all of the information, but it's a bit unreasonable to expect token holders to, you know, be subject matter experts. And I so think that a lot of the time, the way that this plays out is that the token holders essentially kind of give way to the the experts, right? Which is usually the devs. And so if the devs say, this is what we should do, then governance kind of just like rubber stamps that, right? Um, so I think, you know, it's uh, wh while I think we will see more governance, um, regulated kind of Oracle protocols, right? And, and there's, there's, I think, really some really critical functions that I think should be decentralized, uh, like the ability to add or remove a validator, right? I don't know why when people talk about Oracles, they don't talk about validators more because the entire integrity of the Oracle falls back on who are the validators, how many of them are there, how many of them, what is the quorum? How many of those validators need to like reach consensus uh, to like update an Oracle. Um, and like, do I trust, you know, these validators, right? Um, and, you know, so the ability to add or remove a validator gives you complete ability, the complete ability to manipulate the Oracle at will because you can Sybil attack an Oracle and just add, you know, yourself as a validator, you know, a hundred times, a million times, whatever it is, Right. Or you can censor the Oracle by just removing all of the existing validators. Right. So like the, the power to add or remove a validator is like God. Right. And so 
Um, fortunately, that's actually like a very simple like mechanism for governance to regulate as well, right? Like it, it's not complicated. I think where it gets, you know, what we just talked about, right? Like the this trade and, you know, this trade off between like the RPC nodes and that decentralization, and then trying to like compare and contrast like the uh, likelihood of say like what is the likelihood that like Infura or Alchemy like goes down like versus what is the likelihood that like a RPC node has like an exploit in it that like a hacker can utilize to like compromise a validator server, right? Those are two very esoteric type of things, right? And even among really technical people who like understand the tech side, it's still like an apples to oranges kind of comparison, right? And so leaving those kinds of decisions up to governance, I think is ultimately going to be futile because like they'll pick something, um, but they'll pick it because they were lobbied to pick it, not because they actually under, or they were scared into, you know, some type of um, being, being fearful of a particular kind of risk. And they're probably not, they're probably discounting um, another risk that is like equally as threatening, right. But is, is not necessarily dealt with. So, um, you know, to, to circle back on your question, yes, there's absolutely things that governance should be responsible for and like validating, like the, you know, uh, regulating the validator set. I mean, that should just be like the default, right? I mean, if every Oracle protocol is not doing that within the next year, I mean, what are, what are we really doing here? Like you've just, like, if you don't do that, you've just thrown in the flag on decentralization by default. Um, I would say like, you know, we also, we in, in 2024, right? I mean, it, it's not like it should be done this year. It should have been done last year or the year before or the year before. Oh, that. I, I mean, look, when we built the first Oracles at Maker, I mean, my, I didn't think I would still be working on this problem like this many years later, right? Like my my understanding was like, okay, we built this thing, it works, it's decent, but you know, let's be real. Like my me and my team are gonna go build die. And I'm sure the private market, you know, some team that's dedicated to just the Oracle protocol, you know, will find like a better solution. Right. And to my surprise, like four years later, when I came back to look at this, it was just like, what the hell? No one's come up with anything better. They basically just, you know, I, I said earlier, all Oracle protocols basically work the same. Like, uh, it, it was mind blowing to me that like everyone had basically just took the model that we came up with and just extended it rather than actually like innovating. Yeah. So it's, uh, it's really interesting. I'm, I'm just going to, I have like another question as well. I just kind of want to follow up here with. Um, so <clears throat> when we look at, at like, um, you know, decentralization in, in protocols, right? I think that, you know, governance can also sometimes bring um, innovation to the protocols, right? I think like in Maker, for example, we saw a lot of the RWA stuff was kind of like, coming in because governance opened up, right? Then people saw the opportunities. Uh, I think also like, you know, some other examples could be like, you know, Spark, uh, for example, right? Which was kind of like this, like, you know, yeah, child born out of, you know, makers open governance, you could say. Mm -hmm. um, and some frustrated team members, maybe, who spent too long, <laughs> much time in the DAO. Um, we also had Nadia and Sam on uh, previously. Um, and then um, what are we not seeing with Oracles, right? Because I feel like, most of what the oracles are doing today is is what was also possible right. back then, right? Mm -hmm. You know, uh, I, I think in terms of like use cases, uh, you know, there was some a little bit of like a randomizer. Maybe you could use it in games, mm -hmm. some proof of reserves. You know, maybe you would use it for a stable coin. But like, you know, I, I didn't, don't really think we saw like a lot of innovation. What, what are some of the, the dreams you have for for oracles apart from putting price on chain? Well, I, I think you touched on something extremely important is that when people hear oracles nowadays, they immediately just think of like, oh, that thing that reports prices, right? And that's, I mean, that's just like a symptom of like the problem, right? I, I think the best way to think about like what can oracles provide is to take your phone 
and put it on airplane mode, right? And then just use your phone like you normally would, right? And what you'll realize is that your apps, when they're devoid of the ability to um, to uh, kind of obtain and transmit data, um, they immediately like shed like most of their utility, right? And so really data is what gives apps like this really rich like utility that that we like you know uh that that we we like love to leverage um and so i i think it, it's kind of like a, a dual kind of, there, there's kind of two problems here to why have oracles not been used outside of the scope of prices and one problem i think is just like where is the money um, so, you know, if you're running a business, right, you need to have customers who will pay you, um, you know, for your service, right? And um, what we've kind of seen in terms of product market fit is that, well, DeFi uh, has a lot of, you know, credit lending, you know, leverage, yield, this type of stuff. And it's all kind of on this, you know, uh, on this bedrock of needing prices. And, you know, these DeFi protocols have actually like gotten some traction. They're actually gener generating revenue and they can actually afford to pay for this data that they're utilizing. Right. So they've actually been able to another way of saying is like DeFi has been able to monetize uh, the usage of data. Um, I talk to people all the time who, you know, especially at hackathons, right, who were like, oh, I have this really cool idea for like. Um, I would love to use like this, like weather data or like this, like farming data or, you know, you know, rainfall. And it's like, and it's like, can you do that? And it's like, yeah, like oracles can deliver any kind of data, right? Um, it's, is there someone willing to pay for that data? And while um, I think DeFi was able to have like a flywheel effect and grow very big, very quickly, I think there's still numerous other kind of verticals that blockchains are going to be extremely useful for, but they haven't quite reached their zero to one moment yet, right? Where first they need to go through the ideation phase, then they need to get traction. Then once they've gotten traction, you know, they can monetize it a bit. And, and even the speculation around the traction will help with the monetization, right? And only then can they actually like, you know, afford to pay for stuff, right? Um, so it's a bit of a chicken and the egg scenario, right? And I think all Oracle protocols, right, are, are always kind of on the lookout for like, well, what at least has like the potential, right? Um, where, okay, like, you know, you can't afford it now, but like, we'd still love to help you do this, right? Because we see that, you know, you have like a real business plan of like how this can work. And unfortunately, like most of Founders Energy goes into, you know, creating, you know, something safe, right? Um, something that, you know, if they stick years of their life into it, right, there's like a light at the end of the tunnel. And so coming up with like new novel things is is scary, right? And uh, it's, it's no surprise, right, that when you look at like what kinds of projects founders are creating, right, it's another L2, it's another Dex. It's another Perpetuals protocol. It's another. It's another Oracle's protocol, right? For for that matter. And uh, so, uh, but like you know, let let me let me be a little bit less uh, jaded and and say like, well, where do I kind of see like the exciting opportunities? Um, I think the big opportunity is going to come with real world assets. Um, I, I think you're kind of already starting to see um, this now. Right. Uh, if you looked at like what did Maker, what did Maker do over the past like eighteen months? Well, Maker recognized that like its DeFi revenue was very boom bust. When number goes up, you know people love to take out loans, and Maker makes a bunch of money. When number goes down, people don't like to take out loans, and Maker makes not a lot of money. Right. Um, now that's very debilitating for an organization because it means that you know during the bull market you're hiring a lot of people and then during the bear market you have to lay off all these people and you have this huge brain drain right so getting this smoothing out the revenue right so where um 
you, know, you have revenue that you know also comes in during a bear market, right? And getting that consistency, I think, is extremely important for not just DeFi but like any organization, right? And so um, for Maker, that was RWAs, right? And so um, there was very you know conducive monetary policy, right, that assisted here. But basically, during the bear market, when DeFi protocols were not making any money, Maker was making you know two hundred million dollars off of treasury bills. Right. And while I while I think Treasury bills is like an interesting use case that got a lot of product market fit um, very quickly, um, I think the the iceberg of like RWAs like is going to be much, much bigger. Right. Because eventually right to monetary policy will uh, relax again. Right. Um, and you know, from a from a yield generating opportunity, right? T bills may not be the the best anymore, right? And so, I think what you're going to find is structured products, um, maybe corporate credit, uh, municipal bonds, right? Things that are a little bit further out on like the the risk like yield curve, um, but but generating significantly better uh, returns, right? Um, now the problem that um is going to happen is um i'm 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 a very big believer in this thesis of like the convergence of like decentralized finance and traditional finance um it's an open question right where on that gradient you know we're going to converge but like we will converge somewhere right yeah, um, I, 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 would prefer, I would prefer it's less on the you know defi gets fully regulated you know to the point of being you know useless uh, front, right, and right, uh, we basically become like TradeFi 2.0. Um, I'm a little more optimistic than that, right? I think that uh, there's a lot of value that DeFi can provide, provided we have like the right regulatory framework in, in place. And so where that is, is essentially going to land us is when you have real world assets, right, integrated natively in a uh, regulatory compliant way in DeFi, um, the technological problem that is going to remain is that RWAs are not DeFi native, right? With a DeFi native asset or like crypto native, sorry, crypto native, with a crypto native asset, right? Um, a smart contract can just go look up the supply of a token. It can go look up the liquidity of a token. It can go look up who's the owner, the issuer, the minter or whatever, Um when it comes to non-native crypto assets like RWAs, um, the blockchain is essentially running blind, right? And the applications that are integrating those RWAs, right, are, are running kind of blind, right? And so while there may be like a team of, of people, of risk analysts, of engineers, of lawyers, right, behind the scenes, right, ensuring that everything looks, you know, looks good, right? From the protocol's perspective, it doesn't know. Right. And so oracles are going to be really critical to giving all of this metadata for an RWA that essentially turns an RWA from non crypto native to essentially being functionally crypto native. And that to your to your uh, question earlier, you know, that metadata is going to be so much more than just prices. It's going to be. um where is this asset custodied? What is the jurisdiction that it's being custodied in? Because maybe a protocol wants to do automatic risk rebalancing of, oh, we want to have exposure to the US, to Singapore, to London, and Dubai, but we don't want to have more than 60% exposure to any single one, right? And so having that metadata about each RWA will enable that rebalancing. Maybe it'll be about yield, right? You know, we just said T bills are generating 5% yield. Well, if there's a monetary policy change and T bills now generate a different amount of yield, the protocol doesn't know about that, right? So um, even not just reporting the raw yield, but the risk adjusted yield, right? Uh, let's say a protocol has like like Maker, for example, right? It has like you know um, several different RWAs that it has distributed credit to. Well, what if Maker wants to redistribute? 
like re -op like optimize the distribution of that credit. Well, this one over here is generating 6% risk adjusted. This over one over here is only two. Well, the protocol should be able to automatically in an automated way without external influence, right? Without a governance proposal, without any of that, like really slow dinosaur kind of two month, three month process. Just be able to be like, yep, yeah, we're going to pull 200 million from here and we're going to redeploy 200 million over there, right? And so there's, so many more of these like uh, like pieces of data that are like extremely important for an RWA. Um, it could even be like liquidity, right? Um, a you know an RWA could become inherently more risky if there's like less liquidity to liquidate it, right? So having a profile, having the protocol have a profile of what the liquidity for the asset looks like can be extremely important, right? So there's there's an enormous amount of data here. And some of it is numerical, some of it's non-numerical, but it's definitely not just the price. Well, gentlemen, I think I do want to call out the time. Uh, I think that's yeah. a great place to wrap. Uh, Nick, just real quick, what's next for Chronicle uh, in the next, say, six to 12 months? Sure. Um, so I think um, it should come as no surprise that we're going to be going very hard into the real world asset space. Um, you know, we're going to be onboarding. Um, all of the big, you know, uh, credible teams in, in crypto uh, to be validators for for Chronicle. Um, you know, so to any of the listeners, right? We, we also standing in line, there. <laughs> <laughs> right? If 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 that's you, you know, we we would love to talk to you. You know, we want to build like the biggest, baddest, like most trusted, like validator set in in all of crypto um, to power, you know, the biggest, baddest, most uh, decentralized oracles in in crypto. Um, you know, we're going to see all kinds of chain integrations, not just from uh, layer twos, but even from the, you know, chain, the rollups as a service, right, through Arbitrum Orbit, through Optimism OP stack, right, through uh, ZK Sync uh, Hyperchain, through Polygon CDK. Um, you know, these, I, I, I think on the, the app perspective, every app is going to end up on their own rollup, right? And they're all going to need, uh, each rollup is going to need its own oracles. So. Uh, I, I think it's going to come as no surprise that us, but also like all the other Oracle protocols are going to be aggressively like filling up that uh, that vacuum, especially as that space starts to starts to develop. Uh, where should where should we send people listening in to learn more about you and your team? Cool. Um, I would say go to chroniclelabs.org um, to like find out more uh, about us like as a protocol. Um, if you're like a data junkie, if you just want to see like how like the plumbing of everything works, we have a great dashboard. Uh, that that's linked on there. I uh, would encourage everyone checking that out. You can see every individual Oracle, every validator, every like price update. You can like verify the cryptography for every price update in your browser to like convince yourself that the data is correct. Uh, it's a really cool like little tool to, to play around with. Um, you know, and if you want to join the community, you know, please follow us on Twitter at Chronicle Labs or, or join our Discord. You know, we'd love to, we'd love to chat. Awesome. Exciting stuff. Thank you so much for joining us today, Nicholas. Hey, th thank you so much for having me. This was great. Thanks, Gustav. Appreciate it. We'll see you on the next episode of Stable Plus.